This is the Develop Basketball Podcast, where our experience is your rise. In each episode, we speak with some of the most experienced coaches and trainers in the industry and tap into their methods of success in player and team development. And I'm your host, Coach Chevy. On this episode, we have Phil Beckner, one of the most elite player development coaches in the country. Phil's had 11 years of coaching experience where he's had stops at Weber State, Nebraska, Boise State, and the G League team, Oklahoma City Blue. Phil is now a professional player development consultant and building his own brand, Be Better, Be Different. With an impressive list of NBA players, he has played a key role in the development of one of the most lethal shooters and scorers in the league, Damian Lillard. What's awesome about this, Phil? First of all, thank you. I, I honestly, you have no idea. I was uh, working out and I get the little notification on my watch that you were like down to get on here. And yeah. uh, I was geeked for the rest of the workout. It was pretty awesome. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, no no problem. People I ask me to do, uh, I just want to help you. I, I like what you're trying to build. Um, I, I like your message. Um, I've probably turned down 10, 12 podcasts the last however many months, especially with the success, you know, Lillard has had and different yeah. guys has had. But um, yeah. I just, I, I, once you wrote me, I, I looked up what you're doing, that you had coach college, our, simi- our stories were, you know, a little similar, yeah. obviously leaving the division one yeah. profession. But um, no, so I, I want to support you and help as much as I can. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. It, so honestly, that was the biggest thing that I was excited about. I, I listened to you on Basketball Immersion. Um, and how you talked about a lot of the trainers who ask you questions and they'll be like, you know, Hey, Phil, what can I do to, to be a better trainer? And, and your advice I think was like the best I've heard from the standpoint of like, just having assistant coach experience helps you to see that it's not just about the skill development. Uh, um, yeah. so I really appreciated that. Cause I'm like, I know that my workouts are different or I feel like they are. Um, but I'd never really processed that that was probably the biggest, you know, influencer, um, when it comes to coming up with a development plan. Yeah, I agree. And and it's a big separator. Um, so many coaches, uh, I mean, I I shouldn't even say so many trainers, I'm trying not to use the word trainer, but so many trainers, I just, they just don't get it. They don't. And like so many coaches crossing over into the world of skill development or player development, they're better because they've coached, you know, like I would say, both sides of the basketball, defense yeah. or offense, and, you know, came up with game plans. So, right. For right. sure. Right. Okay. So, um, just to kind of get started, I, I, I'm really intrigued by your story. Um, you were at Weber State for seven years. I was at Creighton for seven years. And I know you probably have uh, some things that maybe encouraged you to get out of out of the college level um but before we get into that what was your journey like as a player um just growing up um and who who influenced you the most when when it came to basketball my, my journey as a player growing up basketball was kind of always my my escape i i grew up with a, a tough family life single mom uh three kids you know so uh we didn't have a lot growing up we went through a lot of tough things growing up so Uh, My escape and my downtime was always spent going to the court, playing basketball and, you know, hoping to be an NBA player someday. And then uh, I was a good player in high school, went to a small, small high school in Arizona and then ended up getting recruited to play college basketball, played at the NAI level, a smaller college in Kansas, actually, and um, played there all four years, went through a lot of ups and downs. We the story I love telling the most about playing college is my senior year. We did not win a game second semester. So like you've coached, I've coached. Uh, we went two and twenty-seven my senior year. We just had the biggest bunch of losers and ding dongs on our team. We weren't very good either, and uh, we 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 could not win a game second semester. So um, I, I was a really good shooter. You know, I think I was an okay player, but uh, obviously that that led me into wanting to be a, a basketball coach. Okay. All right, so you decided to to take it seriously and you obviously have been able to create a mentality or understand what that looks like when it comes to identifying players. Um, What did you feel like kind of helped you to identify who was going to have a lot of potential? You know, when you were at Weber State, for instance, um, how did you kind of figure out like, okay, that kid has potential to be really good and they've adapted the right mentality? when they're from the high school level, you know what I mean? Um, where you haven't worked with them physically. 
Absolutely. I think um, that that's probably the separator nowadays, to be honest with you. That's such a good question because so many coaches are or trainers are like strategic or, or concept based or skill based. And I, a lot of times we're, we're more mentality based first. We want to work on our mentality, our habits, our characteristics that are going to separate us both as a person and as a player. So go, going back, you know, and to answer your question of how do you see that in kids before you work with them or whether you're a college coach evaluating high school kids or now, you know, I do a lot of stuff for the USA Junior National Team, finding those kids who are going to be special beyond the next couple years of their career. I, I think it comes back to me having just been around elite individuals. And not just like players that are elite individuals, but some of my mentors were great coaches or a private trainer or a strength coach. And they coached you to have that different elite mindset every day, or they held you accountable to a, to a high set of standards. But going from high school to college, uh, I'm sorry, the high school to college level at Weber State, I was still young. I still didn't know. But the, the one thing I tell every player, and, and you could probably relate to this with a lot of the, the kids you work with or the kids you coach, is um, I say, if everyone's saying the same thing, it's probably true. Mm -hmm. Like if everyone keeps saying like, you're tough, you're tough, you're tough. Well, you know what? You're probably a pretty tough kid or you're a pretty tough player. Or if everyone's saying like, ah, uh, you don't have the best body language. You don't have the best yeah. body language. You don't have the best body language. So yeah. one of the biggest identifiers you could do is you could just ask kids like, hey, what is their, what, what are your labels? What do coaches keep telling you? Do they tell you you're stubborn, you're hard headed, or do they tell you you're willing and you're hardworking? And it's those type of things that the more you get around other players, other coaches, you, you just start to pick up on those characteristics and identify them in the players that you're going to work with. Mm -hmm. So what, what kind of player were you? Um, uh, I, I thought um, I was going to share this earlier. Uh, Talent-wise, decent player. But you know what I was? I was a really bad teammate. And that's something I've had a growing as a coach and as a leader. And looking back on it, I, I wish I was a way, way better teammate. I was super competitive. I was super driven. But because of that, I wasn't a good leader. I wasn't always a good teammate. I wasn't always a good fan of the other guys on the team supporting them. It was kind of like, let's win. Let's get it done. Let's get out of the way. And yeah. obviously, a guy I work with uh, really closely, Damian Lillard, who they say is one of the best athletes in pro sports or one of the best um, – uh, leaders, you know, in pro sports and leaders in, in the NBA, he's phenomenal at that. He's a killer uh, competitively. He's, you know, going to try to rip your throat out every time on the court, but he's an unbelievable teammate, an unbelievable leader. And uh, looking back, that unfortunately, one, one of my negative labels, I always say, is I, I, I was a bad teammate. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah probably pretty, gets pretty, a lot pretty to authentic like. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, when you. It took me a while to be honest with myself because I, you know, I, I played at Creighton um, and I felt like I was a pretty decent player. But the, the older I get and the more I coached, um, the more I realized, like, wow, I probably wasn't very efficient scorer. You know, I could score, but it wasn't efficient. Um, and that influenced me from the coaching standpoint as far as who I recruited and how I developed. And it felt like mm. it felt like that helped me to recognize, okay, I don't want you to be like me. So this is what you need to do. And this is what, what I wish I would have done. Um, do you feel like that was kind of the same for you when you became a coach once you realized like, Hey, I wasn't that great of a teammate. Absolutely. That's uh, you actually kind of gave me goosebumps just now when you were saying that, because you put it um, in such a profound way, like, and, and obviously I coached division one as well. So I remember sitting on, in, a gym on a Saturday morning at an AAU event and you know there's just some players that they're maybe on the team of the kid you're recruiting and you just can't stand them yeah. <laughs> and looking back on that I probably couldn't stand that kid because I wouldn't have been able to stand myself back then and um, that, that I mean <laughs> you 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 really hit it on the head right there that, that's a great point and, and I think moving forward too now whether it's training guys or working with teams or groups or organizations like you, you just you don't want to be associated with um, things that held you back in the past. So right. when I told you we went two and 27, that probably impacted my coaching career as much as anything, because I saw teammates who would screw around too much, teammates who wouldn't share the ball, uh, mm -hmm. teammates who party too much. I know what mistakes I made personally too. I wasn't perfect. And I'm like, all of those 
actions and all of those poor responses resulted in two wins yeah. and 27 losses. So especially like when we were at place, places at like Weber State or Nebraska or Boise State, as soon as I saw those behaviors or actions, I wanted to cut them out right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can totally relate to that. Um, wow. So, so like when it comes to thinking about yourself and when you were in high school, um, what would you, what would you tell yourself and, you know, give yourself a piece of advice outside of the fact you would, you would tell yourself to be a better teammate. Um, what would you have told yourself, uh, from a developmental standpoint to help you play at a better level? Um, you know, physically, not, not the level of play at Kansas, but, um, what, what would you have told yourself for advice? Yeah. Um, it, it's probably the same advice I'm giving a lot of kids right now. I wish, uh, I see it over and over again, cause I get to work with kids about high school level, college level, and obviously the NBA level. But I would say find a mentor or a coach who really believes in you and wants nothing from you and just listen to them like your life depends on it. Hmm. Like really find a mentor or coach who believes in you and wants nothing from you. They really don't care like what school you go to or what shoe company you wear or any of that or what agent you're going to sign with someday or just, they, they don't want anything from you. But and just listen to them like your life depends on that. Because I think too many times, um, like in, in high school, I, I didn't know how the recruiting process worked. I mm -hmm. didn't know if I could play at Arizona State or if I could play at Kansas Wesleyan in AI school. I didn't know if I was working hard enough or too hard or not enough. And if you just have that mentor or coach, if you could find the person who believes in you and be like, man, this, this dude just has my best interests at heart. And he really wants nothing from me. He just wants me to be the best version of myself. He wants me to be really, really good. Yeah. I would be listening to that person like you couldn't believe. I would be asking them a ton of questions left and right. And, and I really think there's a big gap in our sport right now, especially in the world of basketball, where, where kids just need that steady voice, yes. that solid voice. And um, when, when they listen to it and when they hear it, they're going to get better more than they expect it. Yeah. And I'm starting, Chevy, I'm, I'm starting to experience that with, with some of the best NBA players. You know, someone asked me the other day, they're like, Phil, do you realize you train like five, six, seven players who've made over $100 million in the NBA? <laughs> and my answer was no, because I don't think about that. Yeah. I think about them as an individual. I think about the next step they need to take to improve, not how much money they've made or their status or things like that. And, and ultimately, deep down, I think they're craving someone like that in their life to help make them better. Yes, that is that is excellent advice, um, and that's honestly something that I rec I recognize that I got lucky with. It, it, when you say mentorship, and you say, you know, someone who doesn't have, um, I guess, an ulterior motive when it comes to your development or where you end up going, um, that's huge. There's 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 not a lot of um, people that are accessible like that, you know. Um, so. I felt like in my upbringing, in my high school career, I was really lucky to, to have that. Did you feel like you had a pretty good mentor growing up? I, uh, I grew up without, without a primary father in the house for the most part. Um, like I said, my mom worked a bunch, of, you know, a bunch of jobs and busy all the time just to take care of us. So my, um, the, the, the biggest people that had the most impact on me were mentors. They weren't you know, someone in the household or yep. telling me to score 20 points or do this. Like I had a couple really, really good mentors um, throughout high school, throughout college, and even to this day still, even as a coach and a leader, like if I didn't have um, you know, kind of my, my Mount Rushmore of successful people I wanna look up to and uh, learn from or get advice from, um, I, I don't think I'd be where I am today. Yeah. Okay. So you have, you have a, a, a certain mentality um, because I, I read or I heard one of the things you said was it, your, your program or your training is not for everybody. Um, yep. You're willing to get rid of guys who aren't willing to do what you're asking them to do. Um, and obviously you've created or you've adopted a mentality um, that's unique in that, from that standpoint. Um, so where do you feel like you've developed your mentality or how do you feel like you've developed it? And when did you notice that your mentality was different from a lot of people in your space? I think uh, my mentality just came from a, a real strong desire to have to make it. And 
um, a lot of people ask questions based on my mentality or someone like Damian Lillard's mentality. They think there's like this just magic switch that flipped or just one, um, you know, landmark in the way where something happened and, and your whole life changed. Uh, I, I view it a little bit differently. I think we've all kind of had, if we look at it, and I'd even challenge like you with this, Chevy, like you probably have some milestones along the way of your journey. Um, high school did you know you maybe you almost got cut or you didn't get first team all region and mm -hmm. um, and then in college like did you get to play right away or did you not um, when I started coaching like uh, a little bit about my coaching background when I took my first college job I was a director of basketball operations at Weber State mm -hmm. I had coached two years of high school in Arizona I was a JV coach and varsity assistant coaching you know younger high school kids and then I went to Weber State and I took the director of ops job. And at that time, it was not paid. So oh. I got zero dollars. I had a little money saved up. I roomed with one of the coaches on the women's staff. He was a great dude, barely paid any rent. But what I had to do to make it was work all day at Weber State, work about like eight to four, eight to five at Weber State. And then I had to work like the night shift at Costco. I'd go to Costco and I work from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. I did that for three, four, five months, and then it was miserable, so I had to quit doing it. So then I'd work all day at Weber State, then I'd go referee men's league games and little high school fall league games at six, seven, eight, and nine o'clock at night. And it, so my, my, my point is like your mentality comes from having to do certain things a certain way in life to right. figure out a way to make it or to figure out a way to survive. And I, I got to the point where I'm working my butt off to be a college coach and I'm looking at some college players, I'm like, hold on, you're not up here in the office at 8 a.m. You're not leaving at 5 p.m. and then work in the night shift at Costco. You have one weightlifting session, one workout session, and an open gym. It's not that hard. Yeah. I think hard is like the single mom who's yeah. riding the bus to work, you know, to support her three kids all day and then riding the bus back home. Like, like that's hard. So when, when we say our way is not for everybody and I'm willing to kick a guy out of the gym, it comes from those milestones along like our journey in life and our, our journey in our career. But it also just comes from a standard of excellence. Like I'm going to look players in the eye and they're going to look me in the eye and we're not going to cheat each other. We're going to be really authentic. I'm going to give them my best. They're going to give me their best. And if not, we're going to call each other out on that. And I'm willing to do that with players, willing to do it so much Literally two days ago, um, there's a player. He was a Phoenix Sun. He's going to be in the G League now. Literally kicked him out of the gym Monday morning because he just kept having victim responses. Mm. And when I looked at him, I said, hey, I'm not going to let you fail. If you're going to fail, you need to go fail with someone else. You need to take those responses somewhere else and go fail with them. Because I'm not going to sit here and just watch someone who could be really, really good, who has a chance to continue to make it in the NBA, not be the best version of themselves. Yeah. Um, so I, I can understand that. So once, once you were, um, kind of getting your opportunity, I think you, you said you were a director ops for two years, right? Yep. And then four, or I'm sorry, five years, you, you were the assistant coach. Um, um, when did you realize in that time, like, okay, I can actually develop some kids. I think, um, I didn't know it at the time. Actually, I, I, I think. I knew I could develop players because one, they, the, the, the players kept coming to me. Like if a player doesn't return to you and doesn't want to keep working with you, I, I think that's a telltale sign. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of the guys were gravitory, gravitating towards me. And it wasn't because I was the young cool guy. And that's what I fight with a lot of trainers or my staff. Not like my staff um, is unbelievable. But we're, we always say like, hey, it's our job to coach, lead, and mentor these players. It's not our job to be friends and buddies with them. We're not, we're not going to be the cool guy like, hey, just because they wear Jordans, we're going to wear Jordans. Just because they want to go to the club, we're going to go to the club. Like we, we don't train that way. It's our job to coach, lead, and mentor first. So I, I think I knew I could develop players because they were gravitating towards me, and I wasn't just trying to be their buddy. Um, it was obviously a little bit of a hard ass to where some people wouldn't want to be around you anyways. But then um, you, you know what really I wish I knew then – um, that, that I know now, and I talk to a lot of coaches and trainers about this, but if you want to know what you're doing is, is working, the player will confirm it for you. Mm. Like one of the biggest indicators for success I get in workouts is like a player be like, oh yeah, I feel that. 
or yeah. oh a coach has never taught me that before or mm -hmm. oh yeah that worked like when 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 players are saying that on their own and bringing it up to you whether they're an NBA kid a high school kid you, you're, you're striking the right chord and you're doing the right things yeah yeah no most definitely um so you got to be when did when did Lillard get there for Weber State what year were you in as an assistant so it was actually my second year. Um, okay. They recruited him my first year when I was there. I didn't recruit okay. him, obviously wasn't on the road. And then he came, um, I was a director of ops still. Uh, here, here's what's cool, you talk about humble beginnings. And, and he just sent me an awesome text today about, because we went to Weber State to train for about seven days, just right now before training camp, about a week ago. Okay. And it, you know, it's great to revisit his roots. Two of the coaches uh, you know, I worked with and he played for are still on staff so it's really great just holistically you know mind body spirit skill wise yeah. and um we were sitting there he has a he has a private strength coach that he brings with him and uh the guy's from turkey he's a strong huge mean you talk about mentality like you ought to interview him he's crazy <laughs> like awesome makes the guys box and but he doesn't know a lot about basketball and chevy you know this you coach so like as an assistant, you have a scout and then you go out before practice and you coach the scout team. Yeah. And again, just like we were talking earlier, like that's the stuff I think trainers are missing. They've never had to coach scout team. They've never had to do the report. Like they've just all, you know, just did the skill work. But um, so the scout team's on the court and uh, me, Dame and his other you know, strength trainers there and a strength trainer, he kind of has an accent. He's like, so uh, coach Phil, he's like, so is that you? Like, was that you here? Meaning like coach and scout team. Yeah. And Dame goes, no. He goes, that was Phil when I was here. And he pointed to the ops guy on the <laughs> side. And I was like, man, humble beginnings. <laughs> like when I started coaching Dame, I was the ops guy. He was this, he was literally 17 years old. And so it was awesome to reminisce about that and go through that. But um, yeah, Dame, Dame came when he was 17 years old. And, and I was a director of basketball operations, not, not getting paid a dime. <laughs> okay. So at some point um, when you guys were, I mean, when you got to be an assistant, you took over his training, right? Um, yep. Because prior to, prior to you training him, it was one of the other assistants, I'm assuming. Um, w w NCAA rules don't exist for me anymore. No, <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, here's what happened. And, and this is a story I, I haven't got to tell a lot. A lot of kids ask about this and a lot of coaches ask about this because they're like, was Damian Lillard always like that? Yeah. And I'm like, like he is now, like he's a rip your throat out killer now, you know, obsessed with, like if we get in a fight now, it's about he's working too hard. I'm like, bro, take a day off. He's like, and I'm like, fine, I'm leaving. I'll fly out on Sunday if you're not taking a day off. Like we'll literally argue about that. But um, here, here's what happened when he got there. And, and this goes back to your mentality question about me. Where do these, you know, where does your mentality come from? And I bring up these examples and these milestones we all go through as coaches, trainers, or players. One of the biggest ones, he, he didn't start his first five games as a freshman. He was really, really talented, but he didn't play hard enough all the time. He was kind of cool sometimes. He didn't, yeah. would drop the ball off the court instead of push the ball off the court and he uh we went and played at long beach state we lost in overtime i think he had like maybe 17 turnovers himself in the game not not 17 but you know he had a lot yeah. um and we got he turned it over like the third possession of overtime and we're just like we're done get him out we're not gonna win the game if he keeps turning the ball over that night we were in the hotel and he was kind of cool he didn't talk to me a ton um but i remember we're walking down this long hallway of a long beach marriott and he was just shaking his head. He's just looking at me, shaking his head. And he's like, man, I got to play better. And I remember it like, yes, I said, no, you need to work harder. Mm -hmm. And he goes, what do you mean? And I go, I shoot with this guy, this guy, this guy after practice, before practice. You're never shooting. You're never doing anything. And he's like, you know what? You're right. He goes, I, and this goes back to like you having a mentor in high school or me having them. He goes, I had a guy, my AAU coach, Raymond Young, who's phenomenal, coached the Oakland Rebels, now it's called Team Lillard. He goes, he used to always get me up, make me work on the weekends, hold my ass accountable, push me, give me a plan, show me what it takes to be a good player, show me what it takes to be a winning player, and I just don't have anyone like that here, and I need that. And I said, all right, tomorrow, shoot with me after practice. And it just started with one small step, 
-hmm. And then it's like, all right, now we'll shoot three days after practice. Now we'll work, get a full workout in on Saturday. But I, I think what, what's special about that is one, he had a willingness to be coached, a willingness to like, to show up and do the work. But then here, here's what he had and what so many kids and trainers have to develop now is an awareness of what you need. He yeah. knew he needed a guy investing in him, believing in him, pushing him, telling him, hey, this stuff isn't good enough. Even to the point it's, I think we've trained for like 13 or 14 years now together and he still needs someone to tell him, hey, that's not good enough. Or, hey, go freaking harder. Or, hey, take a day off now. Or, hey, that was phenomenal. Great job. And he just, for a 17, 18-year-old to have that awareness of what he needed is, is pretty special. Yeah. I mean, that, that when, you, when you say, especially, no offense, especially for a guy. Because I feel yeah. like, at least my experience, you know, with talking to, to men bas men's basketball players, all of them think they're going to the league, number one, um, but it's really hard for them to admit their weaknesses or the things that they're coming up short on. Um, so for him to be able to do that at a young age is, is pretty telling. But that's, that's awesome. So as you get to the seventh year and you are starting to get the feel that you're ready to be done at Weber State, talk about what that process was like and, and what made you make the jump to um, getting into training. That, that, that's a really good question. Um, and it's something I, I, I share pretty candidly now, and, and I'm pretty open about. There were, there were two times I left college coaching, one at Weber State when I went to work for the Oklahoma City Thunder, and I was an assistant with their G League team, and then obviously went to Nebraska like we talked about, Boise State. And then after Boise, I just, you know, I, I trained full time now, the last three three years or so. Um, n number one, uh, the, the first part, of, I was ready for a new challenge. And I think um, we all get wrapped up in coaching. And I hear this all the time from coaches who ask me to mentor them, whether they're trainers, high school coaches, college coaches, like, I want to coach the best players. I want to work with, with, with better players or more talented players. And that, that's something I made a mistake on. I was like, oh, just because you're around a Kevin Durant or Russell Westbrook with the Thunder, you know, and getting to know them or see them in practice every day, it might not be the, the best job to coach them every day, or that might not be the best fit in your life at that time. But um, what, what, what really, really happened when I left Boise State to do this full time is uh, I didn't have enough balance. I, I worked too hard. I was too crazy about recruiting. Um, I was becoming a person and coach that not only I didn't like, but some of the staff and players didn't like. I was completely consumed with winning, development, all the things that could just, you know, consume us in life professionally. And, and, and it was turning me into a person I didn't want to be. And I just thought it was time for um, me to really find out, like, who I want to be, how I want to do things, what I want to be about. And, and, and I just thought when, when I originally left, I had three or four NBA teams reaching out to me, um, leaving Boise State. I thought I was going to take an NBA job, but um, talking to Dame and a few other players I was training, I'm like, you know what? I, I just want to impact people. Yeah. I, I want to try to help make them the best version of themselves. Uh, a little bit, too, goes back to what you said earlier about getting to work with the people who aren't doing it just for recreation, mm -hmm. the, the people who are really purposeful about stuff because – when you're on a college roster, I mean, you might have four, five, six kids who want to be great or who want to not, and not even be great. I think being great is becoming the best version of yourself on and off the court. Right. You're not always going to be first team all Mountain West or first team all Big Ten. But if you could look in the mirror and be like, hey, man, I gave it all I could. I'm the best version of myself. And, and I was really tired of working with kind of average unachievers or people who are just like lukewarm competitors, like lukewarm competitors, you know, make me sick. So I said, Hey, I, I want to find more balance in my life. I want to really serve and impact more people. And then I want to work with really high performers, whether it's the division one level, division two level, division three college player, mm -hmm. whether it's an NBA rookie or an NBA all-star, I want to work with people who are aligned with the same mission and vision and values that I have. And, and, and it was a really, really bold step to move forward and do it. But at the end of the day, like I, I've loved every, every aspect of my job now getting to do this. That's so cool. Yeah, it's, it's really, really cool to see that you did that. And, I, and I'm sure you had some reassurance, obviously, like you said, with, with Lillard and people kind of telling you that this would be a good thing for them too. I'm sure that was a, a <laughs> part of it, perk for them. But um, so, 
now that you're doing that full time, you have you have um, be better to be different, yeah. right? And that's that's something that you came up with. Um, and what can you just talk a little bit about why that came about or why that was something you felt very very strong about? Absolutely, it's a um, that's a message that uh, I think I've somewhat lived by trained by, worked by, and again, um, going back, these are why your questions are so good. Uh, they, they all kind of flow together, but going back to those, uh, those kind of milestones or the, those landmarks, you know, of developing a mentality. I was at a, uh, a coaching clinic years, years ago. I want to say maybe it was my, after my first year at Weber State, or maybe my second year at Weber State, and it was this private um, invite only coaching clinic. I'd begged my way into it. There's like 50 coaches invited. They're in Florida and they would have, I mean, like Brad Stevens is sitting there. Doc Rivers is speaking at it. it is, I didn't belong, but I was smart enough to write a note, beg my way into it. And, um, I went through, I went to the clinic and they have all these different coaches speaking and a former division one men's head coach who had got fired. He had actually got fired, um, two years before, he spent that previous year before the clinic watching practices, doing TV games, doing all this different stuff. And he, he just was going to kind of go through a whole bunch of different things he had learned since being fired. And he kind of started off his talk. He, he didn't even really mean to say it. And, and we're actually friends to this day still. He didn't even know the message came from this. But he goes, you know what I figured out? Just being around all these programs, seeing the best of the best, all these. Uh, he's like, the people who win, the people who are the best, they're either just better or they're different. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this light bulb came off and, you know, it exploded in my head because I'm at Weber State. We're trying to get over the hump to win a conference championship. We're not maybe as good as Montana. We're not better than them money, financial, you know, all that stuff. Um, I also have a young little guard there, uh, Damian Lillard, who's pretty good, who could be special, but he's not just better than the guys at Duke. He's not just better than the guys at Kentucky. So if you're not better, or you're all, not all your schools are better than, then what do you have to do? You have to be different. Yeah. So different is how you train, how you treat people, your mindset, your habits, just like, I always say, like, if you follow the crowd, you're probably going to get lost in it. Like if everyone's going left, I'm going to go right and try to figure it out. Yeah. And, um, and then, so, you know, I've always told guys, you either got to be better, or you got to be different because we, we, but we all also do have certain strengths. We are, we are better in certain areas emotional intelligence, talent, you know, not everyone gets to be seven foot like Dwight Howard or six, eight, like LeBron, but we do have gifts. And so as we started training that way, I figured out the guys who are better and who are different, they always end up being elite. And Lillard's a tremendous example of that. Steph Curry's a tremendous example of that. They're better than a lot of guys, or maybe they were different for so long, they became better than a lot of guys. And now that they're better and different, then they're elite. And um, it was as simple as uh, I just wanted to serve our guys. You know, I mentor and train different players. So about a year ago, I got them wristbands made and just said, be better, be different. And they loved them so much. They were just like, like one NBA player, he texted me back two days later. He's like, I can't believe you gave me that. Thank you so much. And so then I got them all hoodies made for Christmas without planning on selling them or giving them like anything. Yeah. And um, they just, everyone loved the message and people started relating to it. And, and we learned it could impact so many other people and so many other walks of life that we just wanted to share it. So it kind of grew from our training group and the players we've worked with to now elementary school teachers, other coaches, you know, yeah. and we're all just trying to be better and different. So ho hopefully someday we could be elite. <laughs> See, that's so cool because it, it sounds like it was really, really organic. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's how, you know, it's, it's legit. Yeah. All right. Um, so the whole purpose of this Phil, is really to like bridge a gap. One of the things that I noticed while I was at Creighton was that basketball is becoming a little bit more luxurious for kids who have the money and have the access to like, you're talking about the people who can help them get recruited one, the trainers and all this stuff. So my goal is to create this platform with really good content. That's going to help high school coaches who have a lot of control over those kids who maybe don't have the resources. And then obviously create easy access for those kids who are hungry for it, but maybe don't have access to the funds to get a trainer, all that stuff. Um, yeah. So with that being said, put yourself in a high school coach's shoes um, and tell me, how do you think you would 
um, schedule your practices to help the kids who really, really want to play in college. Because you know how it is. You, you say you have 15 kids, 15 guys on a, on a team or girls, um, and maybe there's three or four who want to play in college. How do you serve those kids who really, really want to play at the next level? Yeah, um, it's funny you bring that up, and I just wrote this down, so I remember to invite you. Um, I, I do a couple online coaching workshops, clinic workshops now. Um, I'm going to invite you free as my guest. Our, our topic for next week, I only do them periodically, but um, it's the, the number one question I get from high school coaches is how do I get my staff to develop players better? Because mm -hmm. there's so many restrictions. You don't have – the whole 45 minutes before you get on the court like Creighton does, yeah. or the 40 minutes after practice like Boise State and Weber State had. But um, so we're going to actually attack that topic and help head coaches develop their staff um, to do it. But the, the number one answer, and, and I think this is the biggest probably failure in player development to help a kid get to the next level, there is not a plan in place for them. Mm. There is not a plan in place for them. You have to sit there and evaluate where they are, where they're trying to get to, help fill in that gap. And, and it might be six months, a year, two years, whatever it is. But I, I, I always say high clarity equals high performance. Mm -hmm. um, literally today, I sent an NBA player who I'm going to work with year round, a whole off season, in season plan. And he was like, wow, wow, wow. I've never seen anything like this. It wasn't so much like the drills we're going to do or the concepts or the time we're going to put into each area. It was that there was a detailed, thorough plan put out. Because whenever we have a plan or whenever we know where we're going, we're going to get there way, way quicker. High clarity equals high performance. So mm -hmm. the example I give every player, my mentor taught me this, um, like Chevy, if I took you to the mall, and I've talked about this on a podcast, like if I take you to the mall, um, like there's one in Scottsdale here, there's like three levels to it, and we want to find Foot Locker. Well, we go to the directory, and the first thing you look for is Foot Locker. Okay, it's third floor, green code, whatever. But you know what you really, really have to have to be able to make that work? the star that says you are here. Yeah. You have to know where yeah. you are and you have to know where you're trying to get to. So if high school coaches really want to get someone prepared for the college level, let's look at where we are. Let's look at where we're trying to get to. And now whatever time we have for practice, whatever extra stuff we have on weekends, whatever you have during your basketball uh, period, let's plug that in between those two points. And I think, Everyone I, could, I consulted with five, six Division I staffs on how to develop players better and how to get the most out of their athletes. The number one problem is they do not have a clear plan in place or clear system in place for how they want to develop players. Mm, I love that. I really love that because it forces you to be really honest with yourself. And like you said, you can't, you can't have, a, have an end goal if you have no idea where you're at to, to begin with. So, um, yeah, because I, I, I think – I'm going to kind of hop over a little bit some of the questions I had, but um, one of the things that I, that stuck out to me that you spoke on was uh, the, the things that a lot of high school or college players are missing. And you talked about uh, footwork and we can, those were the two biggest things that they don't work on or the things that they're missing. Um, and, and kind of with that, if you are a high school player right now, uh, your goal is to play pro basketball you maybe live in a small town or maybe you're in an under-resourced community where there's not a lot of access to resources. Um, how would you suggest that they, one, find out where they are so that they can create, you know, a clear, thorough plan? Um, and I guess, what would you do if you were in their shoes? Uh, I'm going to answer those in a flip-flop order. So you, number one, you said, what would I do if, uh, if I was in their shoes? No, number one, I, I think I was in their shoes. We, mm -hmm. um, I was on the free lunch program in high school. Mom's working. Um, I got my sister up every day and helped help get her ready for school. We had food stamps, you know, so like I have been in their shoes and I wish someone, um, people did speak life into me this way, but, but I hope people like you, me, or if they're listening, you know, this podcast or this call that like they, they really hear this and they know, like I almost dropped an F-bomb, but, but I'm not going, but like they know it freaking works. You could do two things. One, you could find a way or two, you could find an excuse. Mm. 
Like you could find a way to make the MBA or to go to college or get a job or buy a car, or you could find an excuse. And I've been blessed. I think God's put favor on my life, but there, there is always a way. You could meet the right person. You could talk to the right teacher. You could show up to the right camp. Just know that you could freaking find a way. The majority is always finding an excuse. Now there's phones, there's YouTube, there's emails. There, the, the, and here's the best advice I could give anybody. And, and I give this to players. You're getting me fired up now. Now I'm getting all, all, all juiced up. But the best movie I think anyone could watch to learn um, to find a way and, and to figure out what it takes as a player or as a coach being a professional is The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith. Yes. That's a great movie. My favorite movie of all time. Like, and, and here's what I always say, and I did it at Weber, and, and I lived in an apartment. I had, a, I still did plenty of food. I ate peanut butter and jellies every in the office, but I, I was fine. But I was, I was really willing to find a way to be successful, and I would just always ask myself, and I would challenge these kids to ask themselves, until you're sleeping in a subway, having to give blood, trying to sell this piece of a medical equipment to support your son or to be in a help homeless shelter, like until you're to that point, you got way better chance than most people because mm -hmm. that guy in pursuit of happiness, that's a true story. He had to stay in a subway, he had to give blood just to, like, until I'm there, like I'm probably going to be okay. Yeah. And these kids could find a freaking way. Do not ever settle to find an excuse. And then the separator though, um, that, that I, I wish I would have known back then, like you said, how, how do you find someone to contact or how do you, what, what's that thing that's going to make you a pro? Number one, the, the skill that's going to be the separator now, and, and they used to talk about it all the time at coaching clinics, but it's shooting the basketball. Mm -hmm. If you could shoot the basketball, whether you're athletic or not athletic, whether you're tough or soft, like if you could shoot the basketball, that's the most elite weapon in the NBA right now, especially as a guard. Be able to shoot the basketball. Shoot, yeah. shoot, shoot. With that, just like me kind of begging in to get into that coaching clinic or asking coaches for help, um, just write to someone on Twitter. Ask them to change, their life, to change your life. Write to someone on Instagram. Like, I don't know you. Um, I love what you're doing. I looked up all – I get asked to do podcasts all the time. Like I told you uh, before we started, I've probably turned down 10 in the last three months. Mm. Your vision, your mission, what you're trying to build, I absolutely love. And all you did was reach out to me. So I'm willing to help you. Like we are built as human beings to help others, to serve others. And people have an intrinsic drive to do that. So if you're a kid sitting there and you're growing up in poverty or parents aren't around, my, my dad was in prison growing up. Like, man, you're going, just ask someone for help. Most good people are going to help you. And you could find a coach on Twitter. You could find a coach on Instagram. Like there's a coach in your area. Like, don't be afraid to ask for help. That is awesome, awesome advice. Seriously. Uh, I, yeah, I think that's good. I feel like you, you're, you're doing a good job of just letting kids know that they, they have the power. They have a lot more power than they think. Um, and I think that that's the biggest thing is, is we want to create something where to empower these kids to make better decisions, one, but also to realize like life isn't just one of those things that happens to you. You can actually do some things to, to you know, make your decisions and dictate.